Hello, I am Dr. Vatsharari Thai Buntinan from the Institute of Human Rights and Peace Studies, Mahidon University. Welcome to Class 11 on Human Rights and Development. In Southeast Asia, people's right to a better livelihood are what is called the human rights to development, and human rights violations during the development are important issues. All Southeast Asian countries have undergone rapid development in the past 50 years and this has had a significant impact on people's lives. 50 years ago, most people in Southeast Asia did not go to school, they did not have electricity, and there were no hospitals close by. A lot has changed since then, with huge increases in access to education and healthcare services. There is electricity in most of the households, and the development of roads and transportation networks allowed greater connectivity and many people have become better off. However, these changes do not occur without any cost. When development happens, people can suffer the consequences of pollution, poverty and displacement. This class will look at how development can violate human rights and ways to respond to this. It will firstly look at what is called the right to development and how this responds to violations occurring in the development process. Next, we will examine a more recent response, which is called the Rights-Based Approach to Development, or RBA. RBA attempts to put human rights into the planning of development projects to ensure that people are protected during the development process. Firstly, we have to look at the meaning of development. Mostly, development is seen as people and countries getting wealthier. The simplest way to measure development is by the increase of wealth in a country, often measured by GDP or gross domestic product, that is the value, the total values of goods and services produced in a country. However, this alone is not a good measurement. Countries can get richer, but many people in the country get poorer. This occurs when there is inequality, so only a small portion of the population benefit from the increasing wealth. That is why measuring development today should include how people get healthier, get more education and other opportunities, and not just how wealthy a country becomes. Governments, the United Nations and most international organizations see development as both social and economic development. Social development is about improvement in social services, such as health and education, why economic development is about people having more income. In the post-World War II era, all Southeast Asian countries have undergone development. From the 1960s to 1980s, Southeast Asian countries took different roads to development. Some countries developed through expanding their markets and opening to trade. This is what may be called capitalist development. Countries which have gone down this road included Thailand, Singapore and Malaysia. Other countries such as Vietnam and Laos have approached development through state control of production and the economy, or what is known as the communist model. Still, other countries like Myanmar and Indonesia have taken a mixed approach, having both capitalist markets and government control of some sectors of the economy. Each of these development models has benefits and costs, during the 1960s, development in so-called third world or developing countries was influenced by the superpowers, the US and the former USSR. But there were many problems in the development process, not just in Southeast Asia, but across the developing world. Developing countries complained about the negative influence of the rich world and a desire for a fair system of development. Let's look at some of these complaints. Countries were often forced to choose their development model, capitalism or communism, for political reasons. During the Cold War, countries had to either support USA and Western Europe and develop a capitalist system, or support the Soviet Union and became a communist. This division split Southeast Asia into two distinct groups, the communist countries like Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos, or the capitalist countries like Malaysia, Thailand and the Philippines. Both of these models have problems. The capitalist model has resulted in greater inequality. While some people got richer, many others did not, and they became poorer, or even entered poverty, as they were left out of the market economy. Another problem was that some development led to violations of human rights. For example, 
A company may be allowed to build a dam and displace thousands of people, but some of these displaced people may not get any compensation. However, the government would ignore this violation because the increased electricity was seen as a greater benefit than the cause of these few people who lost their homes and livelihood. For the communist model, there were problems of state control of development and people not being able to participate in decision making. A well-known example is China's one-child policy, where the state decides that each family can only have one child. Though it drastically reduces poverty in China, many people were unhappy about not being able to have more than one child. There were also problems at the international level, where developing countries would sell their resources cheaply to the rich world, say rubber, oil or minerals and they would have to buy back the goods made from them, say cars or machineries, at a greater expense. Developing countries saw this system as unfair and wanted to respond. We will now look over the history of development in Southeast Asia in more detail. By the end of the 1960s, most Southeast Asian countries had developed little. Poverty was high and few people outside of the city centers had access to quality health and education. There were many problems with development in Southeast Asia. For some countries, this was due to Cold War conflicts. For others, it was that development programs did not see much change in the lives of its peoples. Let's outline a few of these problems. First problem is that development was political. Countries followed the development theories that it corresponded to their political ideologies. So those countries supporting communism collectivize agriculture and push government-directed national plans. On the other hand, capitalist countries supported free markets and increased trade. Another problem was that development was measured only by the economic success or failure. It was measured by the wealth of the country and not the well-being of its people, their education, or their health. A problem throughout the region was the focus on large infrastructure projects like building freeways, electricity stations, factories, and dams. Improving infrastructure does increase services and industrial production, and in turn, encouraging growth in the market economy and increasing national wealth. However, that large infrastructure is bad for the environment and prone to corruption. Governments wanted development at any cost and this led to lawless development, where a development could break laws and violate people's rights because the development was considered more important. Communities had their land taken to build dams or electricity stations. Farmers' crops were destroyed by pollution. But these actions were allowed because the benefit of development was more important than the violation of these people's rights. Finally, a problem was the belief that benefits gained by the wealthy during development would trickle down to the poor because of the money they spend would develop the economy. Because of this theory, development did not target the poor and in some cases even targeted the wealthy. But money did not trickle down to the poor and the result was an increase in poverty as the rich got richer and the poor missed out on development. I think there are three major concerns about development and its impact on human rights in the region. Firstly, it's about the participation of the people in the development project, because in many cases, the government initiates development without consultation or without participation from the people, and those, but those development projects would have impact on the livelihood of the people. And that, that links to the second concern, which is on the impacts on the livelihood of the local communities, especially from those uh, large-scale development projects that use lots of natural resources, for example, the hydropower dam or um, the, the power plant project that would, in many cases, uproot the whole community. The third concern is on the cross-border development project that uh, have the, project, the development may happen in one country, but it have impact across the border into another country. The examples are the dam in Mekong, Upper Mekong River and in Sarawin River that have impacts on the fishermen downstream in Vietnam and in Cambodia. 
So, the 1960s and 70s had many problems with development. One response to the problems was the movement for a right to development. The movement came from the developing countries, particularly the so-called non-allied movement, who wanted to avoid being allied to either communist countries or the capitalist West. They had a number of, of objectives. These included a fair system of development for poorer countries, ensuring that rich countries would continue to support poorer countries in their development, and to reduce the conflict caused by developed countries interfering in the developing world. The main idea was that development should be a human right. That is, it is a duty of states to ensure that people have development, that they can be lifted out of poverty and have a safe and secure life. This idea is expressed in the Declaration on the Rights to Development, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1986. The Declaration made some advances in recognizing the rights to development. For example, it says that the person is the central subject of development. It is not the economy or business which is the subject of development, but people. However, there were also some weaknesses in the Declaration, which meant it was not universally accepted. We will now look at the Declaration in more detail, including why it was not universally accepted. The movement for a right to development comes mainly from what were then called third world countries, or poor countries that were not on either side of the Cold War. The call for a right to development aimed to make development compulsory for all countries, by considering development as a human right. This could mean that rich countries should give aid to poor countries no matter their political or economic views. The Declaration of the Right to Development was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on 4th December 1986, but it was not universally supported. The Declaration came after a decade of discussion and debate between developing and developed nations, which had deeply divided opinions about this right. At the UN, most poorer developing countries unified behind the call for a right to development. Developed countries, on the other hand, saw it as a political gesture. The Declaration had new and novel ideas about development. For example, that people should be regarded as the object of development and not wealth, economy, or GDP. We now accept this when development is measured by improvements in people's lives, like in human development. Another good part of the Declaration was that it demanded participation in development. Before, people were rarely consulted about development projects, so they were unaware, or never told, what impact development would have on them. Nowadays, participation is seen as a human right. On the negative side, the Declaration required complete disarmament, which was unlikely during the Cold War. This was one of the reasons the Declaration did not get universal support. Other reasons were it asked states to stop violations such as colonialism, foreign domination, and foreign interference. European countries with overseas territories were obviously concerned about this article as were other countries who considered the list of violations too vague. Just what was a foreign interference? In the end, the Declaration was adopted by the General Assembly, with only the United States voting against it, but many developed countries voiced their concern about it. As we will discuss later, the Declaration was not transformed into a treaty, but the idea of a right to development was taken up in other declarations and treaties. Let's look briefly at where development appears in international documents. The earliest mentions are in the United Nations Charter. One purpose given to the UN is to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems of an economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian character. At the UN, the Economic and Social Council is one of many bodies devoted to development. Development was not directly mentioned in the UDHR, but Article 28 does say the duty of states is to create a social and international order in which rights and freedoms can be fully realized. This means an international order helping with providing work, food, housing, and so on, which broadly means states should help each other develop. Though there was not an agreement on the right to development from the Declaration of the Right to Development, 
it was not long before there was universal support. This appears in the Vienna Declaration and Plan of Action, which is the outcome document from the World Conference on Human Rights in 1993. It clearly states that the right to development is a human right when it says, the promotion and protection of all human rights, including the right to development, must be considered as a priority objective of the United Nations. Other statements recognizing the right to development are found in the program of action coming out of the International Conference on Population and Development in 1994, which says, the right to development must be fulfilled so as to equitably meet the population, development, and environment needs of present and future generations. Also at the World Summit for Social Development held in 1995 in Copenhagen, the outcome document, which is the Copenhagen Declaration and Program of Action, gave as one of its first commitments to reaffirm, promote, and strive to ensure the realization of the rights set out in the Declaration on the Right to Development. Finally, the Beijing Platform for Action coming out of the Fourth World Conference on Women said it reaffirms the importance of the right to development for the advancement of women. These statements show that the right to development is now universally accepted. Global events were to overtake the right to development. Though the right to development is now acknowledged as a right, the debate about the relationship between human rights and development has moved to other areas. Partially, this was caused by the rise of globalization, with most of the world, including communist countries, adopting capitalist economies. The concerns about human rights and development became issues relating to international trade, financial crisis, and economic policies from the IMF and the World Bank. For Southeast Asia, the 1997 economic crisis, which started in Thailand, made people aware of the impact of financial crisis on people's rights to education, health, and work. There were also concerns about the power of transnational corporations, which we cover in the class on business and human rights. Globalization also saw the increase in the number of NGOs working on issues of development. Quite quickly, development became an activity of civil society and not of the state. So the role of states and the politics between developed and developing countries was more a part of the anti-globalization movement and not so much of the development sector. At this time, other important advances in development include the United Nations using the concept of human development, which defines development as improvements in health, education, and wealth. The UN also introduced the Millennium Development Goals, which overlapped in some areas with human rights, but do not explicitly address human rights. All of these changes meant the debates around a right to development were not so important. And rather, people were more interested in making sure that the process of development itself was fair to people and that it was successful. The most common way this is done now is through the rights-based approach to development. This approach is a way to ensure that people's rights are respected in development and that the development itself is good for human rights. The rights-based approach is not a law or a standard, but a list of suggestions or priorities which people involved in development should do. The objective is to make sure that development is good for everyone's human rights. There is no single understanding of the rights-based approach. Let us look now at some ways that rights-based approach is understood by different organizations. The rights-based approach, or RBA, is an approach and not a law or a standard or a formula. It provides a way to approach a problem or plan an activity to ensure human rights remain central to the development process. For this reason, there are as many types of rights-based approach as there are organizations that use it. For example, a previous High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson, defines the rights-based approach as a conceptual framework for the process of human development that is normatively based on international human rights standards and operationally directed to promoting and protecting human rights. The Department for International Development of the British government said the rights-based approach means empowering people to take their own decisions rather than being the passive objects of choices made on their behalf. 
As a final example, the Swedish International Development Agency said a rights-based approach translates poor people's needs into rights and recognizes individuals as active subjects and stakeholders. It further identifies the obligations of states that are required. So, let's run over some of the important features of a rights-based approach. Firstly, a rights-based approach to development says that the objective of development should be enhancing people's human rights. People should be able to exercise and enjoy their rights more sustainably through a development process. Therefore, development is not just about building something or teaching someone, as these alone do not guarantee that people's life will improve in a sustainable way. For example, if a government is building a bridge, that bridge should lead to a greater exercise and enjoyment of rights by people, say, through their access to health and education, and not be just a bridge to nowhere. As such, it is important to point out that rights-based approach requires that state respects, protects, and fulfills the basic human rights of people, and so access to an enjoyment of education, health, and other basic entitlements are considered a right and not a welfare. The second important feature of the rights-based approach is that there should be no human rights violations during development. Development should not take away someone's job or their house. Previously, violations were justified, and it was said that development always has winners and losers, and some people had to lose for some greater good. As mentioned before, there is a problem with this way of thinking, as it is the poor or the marginalized who always tend to lose. So it should be possible for development to be done without violating people's rights. Using the example of the bridge, it cannot be built by taking someone's land or forcibly evicting people. Other important elements include that development must be participatory. Stakeholders in the development, and especially people affected by the development, should be informed about the development and be able to talk about it, complain about it, and make suggestions on how to improve it. Participation is not only a human rights, but also a way to improve the development. In the example of the bridge, the people who use it should have some say about where the bridge is to be built and who can use it. There is also the importance of accountability. The group doing the development must be accountable for all the effects of the development. In the example of the bridge, if there is a lot more traffic after the bridge has been built, then the developers should also consider making roads safe for pedestrians as well. These are some of the elements of the rights-based approach. There are a number of other elements which we will now discuss. There are a number of features of the rights-based approach. Already discussed is that the objective of development is to improve people's rights, that there should be no human rights violations during the development process, and that all people participate in the development process. We will briefly cover some other features of the rights-based approach here. An important feature is to distinguish the rights-based approach from charity and needs-based approaches. A charity approach is to give money as a way to solve the problem. Its common forms include begging or organizations asking for donations. Charity is useful but limited in what it can do. Charity does not create sustainable development nor deliver aid in a transparent and accountable way. An act of charity, for example, Giving money to a beggar on the streets will not stop that beggar from begging. Further, there is no control over what the beggar will do with that money. The needs-based approach is more sustainable as it addresses an individual's fundamental needs. Food, water, and shelter. Addressing someone's needs will help them survive, but maybe not develop. This approach is best in emergencies and disasters, where people need food, water, or shelter, and they will require these quickly. A rights-based approach assumes the person needing the development is a rights holder, and the task is to ensure the person gets their rights. At the same time, the organization doing the developing is a duty bearer, whose duty is to ensure people's rights. A person who needs development has a right to the development. It is the duty of developers to ensure they are met. So the developers must first find out what rights are missing and then get these rights. This makes the rights-based approach a difficult process. 
it needs to identify missing rights and fix them. But if it is done, the person is guaranteed to have their life improved. So the rights-based approach is not the only process, as charity and needs-based approaches are quicker, easier, and better suited to some situations. However, a rights-based approach will ensure a person gets development. The last feature of the rights-based approach is empowerment. People who cannot access development are disempowered. They may face violations during development or do not have the ability to claim a right to something. Fixing these inequalities is an objective of development under the rights-based approach. Examples of empowering the disempowered include educating women, allowing access to finances, teaching people about their rights, and so on. People are empowered through knowledge or gaining better access to services. A rights-based approach has other features than those listed here, and different organizations take other approaches to rights-based development. That concludes the class on human rights and development. We have looked at how development can violate human rights and how this has been responded to by the right to development and then the rights-based approach to development. Development continues to be an important area in the promotion and protection of human rights in Southeast Asia, as countries like Myanmar, Vietnam, and Cambodia are still undergoing rapid change. It is crucial that human rights are monitored and protected.